Let, let, let me introduce myself. My name is Jim Graff, and I'm the moderator for plenary number four. Um, the Earth Observation Committee and the Geo, uh, GEOS uh, subcommittee have been and are sponsoring different events associated with Earth science topics. We started in uh, Korea with a uh, plenary session on, carbon, on monitoring of carbon dioxide from space. And that has been followed up uh, today with a session this afternoon, B16, which will have a series of papers on that very topic. And I encourage you to attend that. We've come forward and said we'll move from the atmosphere and come back down to the oceans. And uh, today our topic is a sea level rise and the societal impacts. Now this is a This is a very vast topic, and so we've tried to break it up into uh, three different categories for you. First one is the measurements themselves, and how do we go out and acquire the measurements, both in, in situ and from space? And how do we calibrate it? What does the record actually show? The second to topic for today is modeling. How do we take that information, take the physics that we understand today, and produce the models that are used to project where the sea, sea level rise will be um, um, 20, 50, 100 years from now. Then the last subject for today will be the societal impacts. If we have the sea level rise, what will be the impact on us as a society? So all of these topics could probably be covered in one or two hours each. It's a very vast topic. What we've tried to do is condense it down to give you a snapshot so that you can see a little bit of what is, uh, uh, what is transpiring today in, in oceanography. Our speakers today are uh, three distinguished gentlemen. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Lee Fu, who is uh, a, fellow as a fellow and senior research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at California Institute of Technology. Uh, he has been a project scientist for JPL satellite altimetry mission since 1988, including Topex Poseidon, uh, Jason, and Jason-1. He received his BS in physics from the National ta Taiwan University and a PhD in oceanography from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. His research focuses on the dynamics of wave, ocean waves and currents ranging from small scale internal gravity waves to ocean basin circulation. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Meteorological Society. And recently he was awarded the Coast Bar International Cooperation Medal for his leadership in the development and continuation of satellite altimetry missions. And he will be talking about measurements as we go forward and move into modeling. Dr. Stefan Romsdorf will, uh, 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 will talk about that. He obtained his PhD in oceanography at Victoria University in uh, Wellington, New, Ze New Zealand. After that, he worked as a research scientist at several um, oceanographic institutes and since 1996 has been at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. His work there focuses on the role of ocean currents in climate change. In 1999, he was awarded a million dollar Centennial Fellowship Award by the US-based James S. McDonald Foundation. Since 2000, he teaches the physics of oceans uh, as a professor at Potsdam University. He's a member of the German Advisory Council on Global Change, and he was one of the lead authors of the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. In uh, 2007, he became an honorary fellow of the University of Wales, and in 2010, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. Our last speaker today, talking about the societal impacts, is Mr. Ron Burke, and he received his BS in physics from the U University of Notre Dame in, uh, in the United States. Um, he has over 25 years of experience in the development of remote sensing systems and related space-based um, earth science and technology research and development. He is presently the director of the Civil Systems Business uh, Development at Northrop Grumman Space Technology. Prior to that though, his, his, prior to this current position, he worked for the uh, uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration as the director for the Applied Sciences Program in the Science Mission Directorate. 
In that role, he uh, participated in the U.S. group on Earth observations, working on Global Earth Observation System of Systems, GEOS, and also on the Climate Change Technology Program. These are our three speakers today, and uh, Dr. Fu will start off with uh, our measurements of sea level rise. One other thing I forgot to mention, um, what we will do, our format today will be each speaker will have about 12 minutes, then we will have a session of discussion up here, and then uh, we will take questions from the audience. Those question, uh, questions are uh, located around the room. Please put up your hand if you would like to have a sheet, write down the question, and then we will bring them up here to the speakers. Uh, after this session, uh, we will be having uh, the speakers stay here if you have some specific questions you would like to ask. And then we will be going to room 3.3, uh, which is uh, upstairs, and we will continue the dialogue. So if you'd like to come and join us, you're welcome to. That dialogue will go on for about an hour. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning. Thank you, Jim, for organizing this session and the invitation, the kind of introduction. Uh, sea level is a powerful index of climate change because the sea level involves both the heat storage in the ocean as well as the melting uh, glacial ice. So both are important elements of climate change. And what I just briefly want to introduce to you, I would call it's a revolution in modern observations because for the first time, we are able to detect global sea level directly from instrumental observations, as well as the spatial pattern of this important change. Uh, it's important uh, for us to have some perspective for the past 9,000 years after the melting of the ice at the end of the last ice age, and sea level has uh, risen by more than 100 meters. And this shows the rate of a sea level change. And Right at the end of the ice age, you know, we got about one centimeter per year or one meter per century. Then it settled to just a fraction of millimeter per year for the past 7,000 years. And this one shows the acceleration and after industrial revolution, the uh, greenhouse gas warming obviously produced higher sea level rise and about uh, 10 times higher than the preceding 7,000 years. So this gives us some uh, perspective about the historical change of sea level. And if we expand the, this record, then in, the, in more details, and this is a reconstruction of the sea level, began with the records of very sparse tide gauge around the world and ending with a very precise measurement of uh, the global sea level from satellite. So you can see from the arrow bars, which shows the increasing quantity and the quality of global observations. And you also see that there's a acceleration, you know, but it's uh, highly variable. If we just draw a straight line through this, then you roughly get about 20 centimeters rise for the past 120 years. And this one doesn't really show the obvious acceleration, which is perhaps best expressed by a parabola. But to show the slight increase of the trend, and another way to look at it is just to uh, draw different lines of different segments of the record. One can do this in many different ways, but then you always get a acceleration. So for the first part of the record, it's about 0.8 millimeter per year. And the, uh, the second part, and also the tie gauge numbers get increased, the record get more accurate, then you see a double the, 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 uh, the, the rate of rise. And for the last part, which about 10, the past 10 years especially, you know, the record shows about three millimeter per year and from the most precise measurement, uh, that's from satellite. 
And I want to emphasize the current rate, which I will elaborate a little bit more later, has already reached one third of the historical maximum after the uh, last ice age. So it's a small number, but it's already one third of the maximum in the ten, last 10,000 years. And the, uh, the last uh, 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and I would call it a revolution, is that the, we directly measure global sea level from space. So this is really the first instrumental observation with global coverage. And the measurement is quite simple. It's basically use a radar altimeter, bounce signals back and forth, and you get a precise altitude. And also from precise determination of the orbit, then you measure sea level. For the past uh, uh, 18 years, we're fortunate to have uh, quite many satellites uh, making the record. And among them, we started with Topex Poseidon. It's a joint mission between the United States and France. That's the first precision altimetry mission specifically designed for measuring global circulation as well as sea level rise. After that, followed by JSON-1, JSON-2, and the currently we, from research to operation, have UMASSAT in, the, in Europe and NOAA in the United States gonna take over to make an operational mission continuing this data record of sea level change. In the meantime, we also benefit from ESA's ERS mission, MVSAT mission, as well as uh, US Navy's GOSAT follow-on. And all these missions actually complement this precision measurement because with all these missions together, we have more coverage and the more detailed patterns of the sea level change. This shows the compilation of the sea level change. After 1992, the blue color indicate the 13-year record from Topex Poseidon, and followed by red part, which is Jason, and uh, the green part was Jason 2, which launched about two years ago. Uh, the point I want to emphasize is that now we have established a technology. We can launch successive missions, and with a seamless uh, transition from one mission to the next, precisely calibrate out the relative bias from different missions and to get this uh, unique global average sea level rise with this you know, obvious uh, seasonal cycle and the El Nino, but if you fit a trend, it's a very short record, okay? So if you fit a trend, it's about three million meter per year. And this is uh, the spatial pattern, which is a map of the linear trend over the past 18 years, then you can immediately see that global sea level rise is not uniform. And this mostly reflects natural variability of the decadal change of ocean circulation associated with the Pacific decadal oscillation, for instance, in the Pacific. And there are many other decadal variability, for instance, in the Atlantic, is well documented. So this highlight underscored the importance to understand the Cato change and its spatial pattern while we're trying to discern the long-term rate of change and the possible acceleration. And now, for the first time, altimetry is combined with the two other techniques to actually decipher the causes of sea level rise. It's very important to know the reasons of sea level rise in order to make a precise projection of the future. And the first cause is very simple. Everybody know when we add heat to the ocean, thermal expansion gonna increase the volume of the sea. And also the heat melt uh, glacial ice, ice, all the ice sheets, and as, as well as mountain glaciers. Then we add more water. And of course, the net effect is total sea level rise. At the present, I would call it a very simple one-third rule of thumb because it happens so that one-third of the three millimeter per year change is attributed to thermal expansion and one-third is about mountain uh, glacier melting from Alaska, Himalayas, and the Alps and uh, another one-third from Greenland and Antarctica. How do we know about this? Okay, so here I'd like to introduce the second component of global observing system for sea level rise is Argo float. It was uh, designed uh, 
in coordination with Jason, you know, the Greek mythology about the Jason Argonauts, you know, so the, 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 all the currently, as of the beginning of this month, as a result of 23 countries, perfect example of international collabor collaboration, and to have more than 3,000 floats, more or less uniformly distributed around the world. And this is the mechanism. Basically, each floats doing kind of UU profiling of the upper ocean, measure the temperature, salinity, and also possibly other properties of the sea. Therefore, we can know the density change, the density component of the sea level rise. And this one shows exactly that. And for the past 17 years, the total rise of sea level is about 48 millimeters. And precisely one third of that has been shown to be contributed by thermal expansion from in situ observations, and that Argo flows play a big role in giving us that. And then what about the difference? Okay. It actually is a split between mountain glaciers and the polar ice sheets. How do we know that? Then we have the GRACE mission, which was a collaboration between the United States and Germany. And basically, there are two satellites. It monitors the relative velocity of the two satellites through microwave ranging. So the relative acceleration, deceleration reflect the gravity change you know, on Earth. And part of the gravity change can be attributed to the mass loss over Greenland and Antarctica because of uh, ice melting. And this shows a map of where all this massive loss of ice sheet occurs, basically all these blue parts, and then we compute the mass loss. It has an annual cycle, but there's a very clear trend of mass loss. And it translates to about 0.65 millimeter per year. And similar things happen in Antarctica, and there's very clear uh, decline and about a half millimeter per year, you add this to, it's about one third of the total sea level rise. Okay, finally, I want to highlight what we need to do in the future. Just focus on altimetry missions. Uh, fortunately, we recognize through international community of the revolution of precision altimetry. Therefore, there's reference missions it started at the present, which here is 2010. Uh, JSON-1 is still uh, flying, still operational. Then the overlapping with the JSON-2, and currently we're planning to have JSON-3 launched in 2013. All this overlap of this precision mission is incredibly important for the calibration. And JSON-CS, which is literally is JSON-4, is currently uh, planned in Europe by ESA as a continuation of the precision mission. As I mentioned earlier, there are complementary missions like the EnviSat is still operational, gonna be followed by the Sentinel-3 and the French Space Agency and the Indian Space Agency collaborating on Altica as a new type of low-cost altimeter. And Chinese is planning to launch two altimetry missions and the Cryosat has already been launched and all these missions collectively gonna increase coverage and also spatial resolution of a sea level measurement. And the GFO, which was the US Navy mission, currently is planned to be uh, succeeded by GFO2. And the, in the long run, the next generation of the altimetry missions, is called a SWAT, surface water and ocean topography, is a, a US and a France collaboration uh, following the tradition of the altimetry collaboration currently planned for launch in 2019, the relevance of this mission for global sea level rise is actually the eddy heat flux around the polar oceans. And that because of the ice melting, the melting of glacial ice is really the wild card of sea level rise. It has the potential of several meters rise in hundreds of years. And the next speaker is going to talk about that and the SWAT will give you the detailed ocean current and the heat flux, which has the potential to melt the ice shelves, which is holding the glacial ice. Once the ice shelf collapse, 
then you have a sort of a floodgate open, then the glaciers were free to collapse. So the, uh, in closing, I just want to emphasize, for the first time in history, modern observations have detected the rate and the pattern of global sea level rise through direct instrumental observation instead of proxies. And the present rate, three millimeter per year, has already reached one third of the historical high in the last 10,000 years. It's very critical to maintain the current global observing system through international collaboration for timely detection of sea level acceleration and, his world, and its worldwide impacts. Thank you. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to follow straight on from Lee's talk and tell you a little bit more about uh, modeling of sea level rise. And I want to start by reminding you about the root cause of the rising sea level, which is, of course, that the Earth is warming. As you can see here, see here from the uh, NASA data, the gray line is the 12 month running average and you might have uh, heard it in the media that at the moment uh, for the last uh, few months or so we've seen absolute record highs in that 12 month running average. Um, I might also mention that uh, here in 19, uh, sorry, in 2008 temperatures were a bit low which made it fashionable in the media to speculate about the end of global warming but uh, that, of course, simply confuses the noise with the signal. We have a steady linear trend and some short-term natural variability uh, superimposed on that, and there is no sign of any change in trend here. This warming actually was predicted in the 1970s. It was, for example, a famous paper by Wally Broker in Science titled, Are We on the Brink of a Pronounced Global Warming? And he made that prediction at a time, as you can see, where there was no uh, observed warming, but the CO2 effect, of course, the physics was already well known for a long time, and the fact that CO2 was rising was also known, so it was relatively easy to add these things up and uh, come to the right prediction. Broker predicted a total warming of 0 0.8 degrees over the 20th century, and that was spot on. Now, the sea level curve has already been uh, shown by Lee. Here I combined the satellite record and the tide gauges, and he also pointed out that uh, it has accelerated. In the early part of the record, you see less than one millimeter per year. At the end, more than three millimeters per year. And uh, later on in my talk, I will combine these two data sets, the global temperature and the global sea level, to discuss how these two things are linked. Lee has also already mentioned the contributions to sea level rise, namely thermal expansion, glaciers and ice caps, and the uh, continental ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, the one-third rule actually applies to that time period he looked at uh, for the last uh, 17 years, I think. If you take look back longer in time in the top panel here, the thermal expansion component was more than a third. If you look at the most recent five years for which have been analyzed, it was less than a third. Maybe this is natural variability, but maybe there is also a trend towards an increasing fraction of the sea level rise coming from ice sheets because uh, as also some of the mass balance estimates for the ice sheets indicate uh, is that the, the loss of ice in Greenland and Antarctica is accelerating quite rapidly. Now, that is the, the key to modeling, of course, is to model these three components, the thermal expansion, which I would say we can do reasonably well because ocean modeling is a relatively mature field. Second component is the mountain glaciers. That is uh, very tricky and done by empirical uh, modeling because you have thousands of glaciers of different sizes, etc. So what people do is uh, look at a whole size spectrum of glaciers and then try and uh, from some that are empirically well studied, generalize for the whole uh, lot of the glaciers. And the third is that you have to model the big ice sheets as I show here. Maybe we can see the movie um, which shows how in our 
Antarctic ice sheet model that is uh, developed in my group, uh, how the ice flows, these particles are just particles like snow on the top of the ice sheet and uh, the flow is illustrated by this Lagrangian uh, movie here where you see how the ice moves. Now the, the ice sheet modeling of course is critical for the long-term sea level rise issue because the two big ice sheets simply are the two big gorillas. Uh, there is about uh, there is enough ice for raising global sea level by 60 meters. Now, most of that ice is quite stable on Antarctica and will sit there for uh, another thousands of years, even if we have a massive global warming. But there are parts, significant parts, that are potentially unstable. For example, the West Antarctic ice sheet, which uh, alone would be good for about six meters of sea level rise globally. Now, I have to say, although we are working hard on this, that the ice sheet modeling is not mature. It, it's uh, in its infancy, and we don't understand the, the dynamics of the ice flows very well and the potential instabilities in this flow very well. And uh, that is why the IPCC, in its last report, specifically excluded that potential contribution from dynamic ice flow changes from its sea level projection. So it, it didn't make a a full projection of sea level rise. It left out one important component because not enough is known about that. And we can also see that in the past, the IPCC has underestimated the amount of sea level rise. Uh, here is a comparison of the record that you've already seen with the IPCC projections made in the third assessment report, and we're running along the uppermost edge of those. So sometimes you read in the media that IPCC exaggerates things. I wish that were true, actually. The data show that in, in many important cases, uh, the IPCC has underestimated the scope of the problem, for example, in sea level rise, uh, for example, in the vanishing of uh, the Arctic sea ice, which is going much faster than expected. So people have been looking at alternatives to project sea level rise. Whilst the physics-based modeling is not quite uh, up to the task yet, and I published uh, in 2007 a paper that proposed a simple empirical link, or it's actually it was based on some simple physics, that I came up with the concept that the rate of sea level rise, uh, so the time derivative of that sea level curve, should be proportional to the temperature above an equilibrium temperature level, T0, where sea level is in equilibrium. And uh, I looked at, uh, in a subsequent paper, at a refinement of that where there is a short-term term added that corresponds to the response of the ocean mixed layer, which is, uh, equilibrates very quickly. And these, uh, these formula can be compared with the actual observations. And now I come back to those two curves that we had, the global temperature curve and the global sea level curve. Now, here's the derivative taken. So you're looking at the rate of rise, and you see this very characteristic uh, curve with low rates in the uh, early 20th century of around one millimeter per year, and then uh, this wave-shaped curve, which actually resembles the temperature curve. And that's why this, uh, this simple formula works quite well. You can see in the, the blue curve, the predicted rate simply calculated from the global mean temperature with that uh, formula that I just projected there. And you can see an excellent agreement here. And uh, if you look at the sea level proper, you see that uh, you can model this with this very simple formula much uh, more accurately than with uh, the, the kind of complex physics-based approach where you have to simulate all the individual components to it. Then you can use that, of course, driving it with temperature projections for the future. That is based on the idea that while we can't uh, predict sea level very well with our climate models, we can predict the global mean temperature very well because that simply follows the planetary energy balance, which is very simple and very well understood physics. So if you take those uh, robust temperature projections and put them into this simple empirical formula, to project sea level, you arrive, depending on the emission scenario, which will uh, rule how much warming we get in this century, you arrive at sea level rise by the end of the century 
that is somewhere between in the range of 75 centimeters to 1 meter 90, depending on our emissions and the uncertainties in the projections. Note that this is about three times higher than the projections of the IPCC, which are shown uh, in those uh, bars here. Uh, this is for the same emission scenario. The uh, AR4 stands for fourth assessment report of the IPCC. And if you simply assume the rate of the last 17 years of 3.2 millimeters per year remained unchanged, then you end up in the middle of these IPCC projections. But in the past, the rate has clearly increased the warmer it got. And that's very logical because uh, ice melts faster the warmer it gets. So I think the assumption that the rate will from now on simply remain constant despite a massive warming, that's a very uh, implausible assumption. And that's why I think these IPCC projections are actually very implausible, implausibly low, unfortunately. And I think the community of uh, sea level experts has uh, now by and large agreed with this assessment and this, this shows all the global sea level projections that have been published since the IPCC report and they are invariably much higher and uh, in, in many cases exceeding one meter by the end of this century. Now a final point to make is that sea level rise will not stop at the end of the century even if we stabilize temperatures. That is because the ice sheets take uh, many centuries to melt. They will keep melting even if temperature is stabilized at uh, whatever, 2 degree, 3 degree, 4 degree above the present day uh, or the pre-industrial level. And also the heat very slowly penetrates into the deep ocean. So that is another reason why for many centuries you will have an ongoing sea level rise after global surface temperatures have been stabilized. So there are a, a very few longer term projections, which are, of course, uh, quite uncertain, but you can at least try and make a, a risk assessment here. And uh, they show that we are quite likely running into several meters of sea level rise in the coming two or three centuries. And uh, the last one here, for the year 2300, that is uh, two and a half to five meters, is based on the assumption that global warming is stabilized at three degrees above the pre-industrial temperatures. That would involve, uh, I think, the loss of island nations, big coastal cities, and so on. In order to avoid that, we would have to reduce our emissions very quickly and quite drastically and uh, stop global warming below the two degree target that was agreed upon in Copenhagen last year. Now that was very brief, so if you want to read more, there is a, a book that I published this year with uh, Professor David Archer from Chicago University. So you can look this up in more detail. The two main points uh, that I want to make here is that sea level rise, according to the current state of knowledge, may well exceed one meter by the year 2100 if emissions continue unabated, and that the long-term rise over several centuries is likely to be several meters, which is entirely consistent with the experience from the Earth history. Uh, Lee mentioned that at the end of the last ice age, sea level rose by 120 meters, and that was due to a global warming of about five degrees. That's the best estimate that we have now for the global temperature difference between the last ice age and today. So at the end of the last ice age, we had five degree warming and we lost two thirds of the then available land ice. We have one third left. And the question is, if we warm the planet by another two, three, four degrees, how much of that remaining land ice that would make about 60 meters of sea level rise will we lose then? Thanks. Good morning to you all. Um, and as we uh, transition into looking at the societal and uh, economic impacts of the information that we've just heard, uh, our moderator, uh, Jim, has asked that if you have questions that you've already composed, um, if you would please uh, share them uh, with uh, our colleagues here in the blue shirts uh, so that they can bring them up, uh, that would be uh, appreciated. Um, so. The challenge uh, at this point um, is to answer or look at the issue of so what 
um, are the impacts um, of this information um, on both society and economy. Uh, the, the, uh, the key challenge is to focus on three principal points, um, and that is um, the information, the commitments, and the resolve. Um, so as I go through um, uh, these, these uh, materials that uh, have uh, prepared, um, please, I, I ask you to think about the degree to which the information that is available to us is compelling to create the confidence and commitments that are needed to formulate solutions that are, can be both mitigation and adaptation, um, and then ultimately the resolve uh, to address and implement these solutions in a way that are going to be beneficial uh, to, to society. The challenge is um, that the sea level change and sea level rise in particular present um, are uh, many, um, and they, as, as pointed out, um, are not uniform across uh, the world. Um, but they have an impact on nearly everyone uh, in the world. Um, the effects of sea level rise include inundation and flooding, of course. Uh, they also affect uh, wetlands and, and, and basically wetland loss, um, as well as coastal erosion, uh, saltwater intrusion, um, which, which of course has an effect on potable drinking water and, and other freshwater uh, sources, and then an effect on the water table itself. Those various um, functional impacts affect economic um, activities that include agriculture, um, that include tourism, that include insurance, and one that um, uh, has uh, very, very significant um, ramifications is the global supply chain. And so uh, just to take a couple of minutes um, at talking about each of these, the, uh, the effects on agriculture um, are far-reaching. Um, we certainly have seen uh, just this August uh, the impacts of flooding in Pakistan. Uh, some 69,000 square kilometers uh, have been flooded and um, have caused or uh, resulted in two and a half, on the order of two and a half billion dollars worth of damage. One of the um, uh, aspects of that is that that, that type of uh, inundation that is sustained uh, is very uh, challenging to recover from. Uh, and it's the kind of impact that comes from a sea level rise condition that is not just a, a, a flooding uh, condition from heavy rain or a, a flooding condition that is caused uh, by a storm surge, uh, but a flooding condition that is uh, more permanent uh, because of sea level rise. In terms of tourism, uh, there are many island states uh, that, uh, that have the potential of being impacted. Um, the Maldives have been in the news um, at a considerable level. I'm going to give um, a, a view of Newmore Island um, and, and its current status. Um, these uh, particular areas of the world um, are, again, on the verge, either are, in the, are experiencing now or on the verge of experiencing uh, sustained uh, impacts uh, from the uh, sea level rise. Insurance uh, is a particularly uh, challenging situation um, in terms of uh, once uh, insurers have looked at their risks associated with, with a location and have determined that they are not able to manage the risk portfolio in such a way as to be pr profitable on a sustained basis, uh, one of the responses that insurers have is to pull out of a given area. And uh, no, in, um, uh, North Carolina and the Outer Banks, um, there's already been this experience uh, that there is uh, such concern about not being able to uh, stay uh, in, a, in a positive uh, way on, from an economic standpoint uh, that they have declined uh, the, uh, 
the option, if you will, recalling that they are businesses, reclined the option to provide uh, insurance in these areas. And one of the ramifications of that is for these million dollar homes that are in, in those particular uh, locations, that um, they're not able to be sold uh, to persons um, who would have to finance uh, the uh, property because they cannot get insurance. Uh, and so you have a, a, a very significant impact. And then supply chains um, are a, uh, another uh, critical uh, dimension. Um, I have a picture here of New Orleans, um, my hometown, um, an area that um, I certainly um, very, uh, very impacted by the flooding from Katrina, um, showing the Superdome as an as a, uh, emblem of, uh, of activity there. But it could have uh, included a image of oil refineries um, in the area. Uh, for instance, the oil refineries in the Houston area that were inundated after Hurricane Rita uh, and simply were just not able to uh, 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 sustain production uh, during that period. And there are on the order of 200 uh, oil refineries that are in low lying areas around the world uh, that can be impacted. Uh, by this uh, sea level rise. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, take a quick uh, look um, to help put in perspective um, what it means uh, in terms of inundation. On a global scale, at one meter, it is a bit hard to discern uh, where uh, the, uh, the impacts are. But as might be expected, they are in, in low-lying areas, deltaic regions. Um, but there are many uh, significant cities uh, that are in these particular areas, uh, New Orleans, of course, being one of those, um, as I mentioned, uh, but many, many others. And as might be expected, there are also many significant ports uh, that are in, in the, these areas. And those ports uh, would have to uh, adjust uh, their operation. Uh, there has been some engineering looks at, being, at creating essentially floating ports uh, so that they have resiliency to, uh, to various levels of sea level rise. But um, in any event, uh, this represents a very significant population and a very significant uh, economic uh, region. Um, so this, somewhere between one and two meters is what Stefan um, identified as the projection um, over the next uh, 100 to 200 years. Please um, keep in mind that there are a number of businesses, uh, including ports um, and, and um, uh, oil uh, refinery type uh, planning that look out over 50 to 100 year horizons, so they're already thinking about these impacts. But I'll advance uh, this USGS model uh, out to uh, six meters uh, to show what the impacts begin to look like um, in the event of more um, catastrophic, if you would, uh, more significant melting of Greenland um, ice and what that does added to the, uh, to the ocean height um, around the world. You'll note that um, now the impacts, even at a global scale, are quite visible. Um, and if you consider what it will take um, for this information to form a commitment for either, either mitigation or adaptation, you think about um, various forms of adaptation, including retreat um, or accommodation or protection. Uh, the issue of retreat, you know, imagine you know, to looking at the Florida or Gulf Coast or the, uh, the Netherlands area in Europe, um, displacing uh, on the order of you know, 707 million people, and, and where, where do they move to? Where do they, where do they go? And what, uh, what, does that, uh, what does that do? And you think about the vast extent, extent of the spatial distribution of these areas in terms of protection um, and in terms of the investments that would have to be made in dikes or locks uh, to control uh, such, um, the water, hold back water from such vast areas. And then for information purposes only, uh, Stefan mentioned that if all of the ice uh, in the world were to, uh, were to melt and enter into the ocean regime, that the, uh, the net impact would be on the order of 60 meters. 
And since uh, USGS um, has included that in their um, simulation here, um, I, I share that with you as well. Uh, not that that is anywhere in the near term, but certainly it does show the, uh, the extent um, and the, the vast impact. So if we can uh, switch back to the presentation. Okay. Um, I mentioned to you uh, the island states uh, impact. Um, one area in particular is this Newmore Island off of the coast of India. Um, it's noted um, that, uh, that there was an argument um, over ownership of this particular island. Um, it, it now um, is no longer a subject of dispute uh, because it is no longer inhabitable um, at, at, at this stage. Um, certainly, uh, there are other very specific places uh, that have taken a serious account of the, uh, the potential impacts. One of those being uh, San Francisco. Uh, they have a commission uh, that they have uh, formed that specifically looks at climate change, climate change issues. Um, and for the projections, the kinds of projections that have been discussed of one order of a meter or more, uh, they are concerned uh, that that would uh, inundate uh, the, the airport. But if we uh, zoom out just a little bit and take a look at the Bay region, uh, we notice uh, that there is a lot more than just the airport that's affected even, even by a meter of sea level rise. Uh, they are uh, deeply concerned uh, that there's on the order of 200 square miles, some of this extremely um, uh, prime real estate, uh, Alameda, uh, Oakland, et cetera, um, and that the impact uh, would, would affect over $100 billion worth of, of development. Looking at that uh, worldwide, um, there are some 150 to 200 million people that um, are currently in uh, these regions uh, within a meter of mean sea level um, and or with growing population, uh, you know, increasing uh, through, uh, through the coming years that will be affected uh, by these areas. We look at the, uh, the total impact on the order of a trillion dollars of GDP. Uh, this is, uh, you know, of course, serious economic impacts. There are four specific regions of the world uh, that, that are dominantly impacted. Uh, David Anthroff um, has done uh, quite a bit of work uh, in, uh, in characterizing the situation. Uh, in particular, North America, Europe, East Asia actually is, is quite dominant, and, and South Asia as well um, are, are um, areas that are particularly uh, significantly uh, uh, susceptible uh, to impact. I switch gears um, a bit here um, now uh, in going on to another effect of sea level rise. Um, obviously, as you add more, more water and then you blow wind over the top of that water, you're going to have a significant uh, effect on the uh, surrounding lands. Um, and uh, storm surge, of course, is, is a condition uh, of, of that, uh, you know, uh, representative of that situation. And so we've already seen in the second half of the, uh, the 20th century a doubling of the number of severe uh, storms and impacts. Um, and we, there's a projection that with increased sea level rise uh, that the impact of, of storms and storm surge uh, will continue to increase and uh, cause uh, societal impacts of, of significance. Um, as, as pointed out, um, these um, are quite, uh, quite difficult to, uh, to recover from, and particularly when uh, the inundation is sustained. Um, in the case of New Orleans, uh, after Katrina, um, it was not possible. Uh, this was not just a storm surge situation as it was on the Gulf Coast, where the water uh, came in, uh, did, uh, in the case of the Gulf Coast, a tremendous amount of damage, but then pulled back out right away. Uh, with the tide. Uh, in the case of New Orleans, because it was actually below sea level, um, it, uh, the water uh, stayed. It took, uh, it took weeks uh, to fully pump the water back out, and the damage was uh, significantly more uh, long term. Another aspect uh, from a society, societal and economic standpoint is that it's not just sea level rise in, these, in several low-lying areas. 
Uh, some of these uh, highly populated cities are also drawing down their water resources, which, are le which is leading to subsidence, and that is doubling, uh, in effect, uh, the rate of impact of inundation is very, very difficult by experience. Um, it is very difficult to recover once uh, you're in an inundated state. Um, it, it, is, it is just not possible to move infrastructure into these areas. Um, Albert Einstein uh, makes the point um, that the world we have created today as a result of our thinking thus far has problems that cannot be solved by the thinking by thinking the way we thought when we created them. Um, I, I believe uh, that to be quite apropos um, under the circumstances. And I bring um, all of this information uh, together uh, to recognize that because there are commitments that are gonna have to be taken around the world, that, there's, that there is a need and a value for a very systematic approach for bringing together the observations that Lee talked about with the modeling capacity that Stefan talked about with decision support tools um, that combine other impacts like population, like economic situation, like subsidence, uh, so that that information can be taken into account relative to the investments that would need to be made uh, in terms of um, adaptation or the policy and other actions that would need to be taken in terms of mitigation so that we can minimize uh, the negative impacts uh, to our society. And, and I close with, with that thought, uh, both in terms of the challenge of what information is needed, what commitments uh, does that uh, inf uh, inform and build confidence in, and, and where is uh, the support, the resolve, the will uh, to take the actions that are necessary uh, to maintain the uh, monitoring and modeling capability uh, so that we continue to be well informed, but also to make, uh, the, uh, take the actions that are necessary to protect the areas that we have shown uh, that are subject to impact. Thank you. We don't have much time, only about five minutes, so uh, we have a number of questions. I may not be able to get to all the questions you have. Again, remember, we will be continuing this discussion in Rule 3.3 after this uh, session. So if you don't get a chance to get to your question, please uh, come on up if you have uh, a chance. There's one question, uh, and that is the latest acceleration appears to be uh, in, the, in the satellite data era. How do we know that it is not a calibration issue? between the pre-satellite data and the satellite data. And I guess this would be for Lee. Is this on? Yeah, th it's a good question. Um, if you look at the reconstruction of the past 100 years, and you see a uh, decreasing of error bars, and reflecting the increasing number and the uh, quality of observations, and, but this trend and acceleration over 120 years is beyond the error bars. And uh, the last uh, 10 to 15 years, the satellite data was calibrated worldwide uh, against uh, about the 30 well-surveyed tide gauges, as well as the grace observation of mass change and Argo observations of density change. In fact, that we have an overdetermined system for this 15 years record. And so we have a highly confidence because of the, all these independent measurements pointing to the current rate of a three millimeter per year. And one can argue whether this three millimeter per year uh, uh, compared to the previous one millimeter per year or two millimeter per year over the preceding half century. But uh, what I can offer is that uh, if you trust the error bars produced by the investigators, and this acceleration is well above error bar. Thank you, Lee. Okay, another question uh, is uh, the science, scientific data seems consistent. How do you, uh, climate scientists wrestle back the agenda from the politicians who only look at the short-term uh, effects uh, during their periods of office? 
So I, uh, I throw that out to you, Stefan. Uh, well, I, I think it was talking about wrestling back, right? Yes. Um, uh, Steve Schneider, who very unfortunately died recently, just uh, before he died, published uh, this book, Science as a Contact Sport, which is a very worthwhile reading where he discusses this very issue. Um, well, since we only have five minutes, there, there is no answer. I don't see my job as a wrestler. I think my job as a scientist is to provide uh, the information and lay it out as clearly as possible. But uh, we can't be the ones fighting with the politicians or things like that. Okay. Anybody else want to take that? Okay. Um, let's try another one. Um, uh, what about the idea that an upcoming ice age has been prevented by global warming? And Stefan? Uh, I would say uh, th that is indeed discussed in the scientific literature. My assessment is that uh, that is very unlikely, actually. We do ice age modeling. Uh, we have been doing that for 15 years or so. And uh, with our models, we correctly predict the onset of past ice ages, and we uh, wouldn't get one now. The, and if you read in the IPCC report, the next ice age, due to the orbital cycles, which can be calculated with astronomic precision, of course, uh, would be due in about 50,000 years from now, but uh, not now. So the, the Holocene interglacial that we live in now would uh, not have ended uh, anywhere uh, near now, but it would have been an exceptionally long interglacial because the Earth orbit has very low eccentricity at the moment. Okay, thank you. And uh, one last question right now in this session, and that is, uh, should we try to mitigate, ad adapt to it, uh, to sea level rise? Should we do nothing? And uh, if we are to take uh, steps, what should they be? So does anybody want to take that, Ron? Certainly a challenging question. Um, one, one aspect of that is that uh, estimates of the cost of adaptation in terms of protection um, are on the order of a half a trillion to a trillion dollars um, on a one-time basis. Um, that's a very significant investment, obviously. Um, the risk uh, is, you know, if, if, if not made, of course, that the, the areas that are impacted would then lose on the order of a trillion dollars in terms of GDP per year, uh, indeed. Um, and we talked about the oil refineries, um, the adjustment uh, to oil refineries, for instance, the cost of those alone. And I bring that up because of the irony um, of the protecting the, the oil refineries as, as, uh, as, as needed to maintain uh, uh, economic uh, 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 engines, um, you know, that's on the order of 20 to 50 million dollars for the levels of sea level rise uh, that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, the investments are very high in terms of adaptation, uh, but if one of the dimensions that has to be taken into account is whether or not you're adapting sufficiently uh, for the actual impacts um, on the time horizons that are necessary. And that, that brings into, into the field of view the importance of the investments for mitigation uh, to try to, uh, to limit the impacts in the first place. Stefano, if you'd like to. Well, I would say you can't solve this problem by adaptation because if you just let the temperatures rise, sea level rise will accelerate and accelerate. So you make huge investments into adaptation and dikes and eventually they will be overtopped. So obviously you need to do both. You have to stop the warming trend as soon as possible and there will be still a need for a lot of adaptation for the sea level rise that is already inevitable. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you that got up early and came to this session. I would like to again remind you that we will continue the dialogue in room 3.3. And I would like to thank all the speakers that have come, on, come all this way to participate. So thank you.